Hi, um, we'll be talking about enabling real-time querying using Druid, Flink, and Kafka today. Uh, I'm Sharanya Santanam. I work at the data infrastructure team at Lyft. And with me is my colleague, Tian Yu. He works in the same team as well as at Lyft. So the mission of our company is to provide the world's best transportation. And we work really hard on the data team to make that mission uh, come alive. So our agenda for today is we'll be talking about uh, the motivation, a quick peek into our legacy architecture, what Druid is, uh, why we chose to go with Druid in our tech stack, a peek into our new architecture. Uh, then Tiani will run us through the Lyft uh, Druid setup and our integration, and also walk us through a couple of use cases. Uh, we'll talk briefly about future work and then open it up for questions. So talking about motivation, so data is really at the heart of every decision at Lyft and real-time data is really crucial for our business. So for example, we really uh, keep really close tabs on market health. We'd like to know like what is the market health or like what is the supply and demand like at SFO airport, for example. And we have general managers who actually are responsible for certain regions and they have levels that they can pull to actually shape uh, supply and demand and make sh uh, shift these so that you know the number of riders and drivers in an area are kind of matched and everybody's uh, ETAs are well within uh, a reasonable amount. Uh, along with real-time data, geospatial information is also really crucial. Uh, uh, we like we'd like to like slice and dice on a region or a sub-region level. And other than that, uh, it's really crucial for us to be able to detect like anomalies at a region or sub-region level uh, in real time. So this is a quick sneak peek into our legacy architecture. Right here on the left is the Lyft app and the Lyft microservices that generate uh, a lot of event data. Uh, so these events are currently in JSON and uh, all of them make it into a Kinesis uh, stream. Uh, we have an application that's based off KCL workers that ingests these events uh, from the Kinesis stream and dumps them into uh, an S3 location. Uh, and there's a, there was a nightly job that would run, uh, which is based on Hive queries, and that was kicked off or orchestrated by uh, Airflow framework. And these Hive queries would basically uh, process all of this JSON information, like read all of these JSON files, convert them into Parquet, which is a columnar compressed data format. And once that's done, a whole bunch of downstream DAGs would kick off, which would basically then process all this information to create a number of fact and dimension tables. Uh, so we use Hive pretty uh, heavily for all of that processing. And Presto is uh, a popular query engine for our end users to be able to do any sort of ad hoc analysis uh, on top of that. Uh, so the problem with this was, as you could tell, is uh, one thing is that we had, there was a lag in data freshness. So basically uh, our users like engineers, data scientists and uh, data engineers were not able to query the most latest data. So there was almost like a 12 hour lag uh, so that was problematic. Secondly, even though Presto is a really powerful query engine, the P75 is around 30 seconds. So that might work pretty well for engineers per se, but not particularly for someone in operation, say for example, who wants to be able to run interactive queries uh, really quickly back to back. So these limitations uh, drew us to looking out for solutions that would help us have a data freshness less than a minute. And we were looking for something that had inbuilt geospatial support and could promise P95 of less than five seconds. So here comes Druid. Uh, I've just copied this from the open source documentation, uh, but basically Druid is an in-memory columnar time series data store. And it's designed such that it provides like sub-second query latencies on real-time as well as historical data. 
And Druid has been pretty popular, uh, used across uh, a lot of big companies and has been known to you know, scale really well to support trillions of events and petabytes of data. So why we chose to go with Druid in our tech stack. So I'll quickly walk you through the feature set of Druid, which made us go ahead with it. Firstly, uh, it has native support for time indexing. So basically every row, you can think of it as every row has a timestamp column and the timestamp column is indexed on. So it's very performant to look up queries based on time filters and intervals. Secondly, uh, all of the data, uh, like when you define a data source in Druid, it is schematized and you have to define which columns would be dimensions and which columns would be the metrics. So dimensions, you can think of it as columns on which you would want to do a filter or a group by on. And metrics are, <clears throat> excuse me, and metrics are basically uh, uh, columns for representing, representing statistics. So like aggregate information. And the way Druid does this is you can almost think of it as like a group by where the key is like timestamp plus all the dimension columns and all of the aggregation happens on this key. So this is an example of like some ride data at Lyft. And what Druid also supports is uh, ingestion time roll up. So basically as you're ingesting data, it can roll up the data uh, on the granularity that you choose, but that is totally optional. You need not use that feature. Uh, Another really nice thing about Druid is it has uh, its internal format, like the internal proprietary format, format which is uh, segments, basically internally makes use of a lot of uh, data structures. Uh, it creates like uh, reverse indexes uh, and uh, bitmap indexes on like all of the columns, the dimension columns. It uses like LZ4 compression and dictionary encoding. So as a result, your footprint on uh, in memory as well as in whatever backup store you're using is really low. And that also helps boost query performance. Uh, there's no shuffling of data between serving nodes. Like if you were to compare it with uh, like a Hadoop or a Hive sort of architecture. So when you fire a query to Druid, the broker uh, basically does an aggregate uh, push down uh, to all of the historical or the serving nodes that have the data. The historical store all of the segment information in memory. So they just like run the filters and everything in memory and all of the data is then returned back to the broker which merges the results and sends it back to the client. And the broker also makes use of like direct memory map. So that really helps uh, boost like the merge performance and works really well for like group by queries. Another really nice thing about Druid is all of its master services are highly available. Uh, so that really helps with keeping up your reliability or nines. And uh, the rest of the services like the brokers and the historicals, middle managers, et cetera, are all horizontally scalable. So it's really easy to scale up your cluster as you have more traffic or more usage coming in. And Druid also has a native support for both batch and real-time ingestion. Uh, we'll be going into this uh, in a little bit of more detail later on. Druid also supports these really clean RESTful APIs. So it's really easy for clients to quickly like submit. You can even just submit all of your requests via curl and be done. And it's really easy to integrate. It was really easy to integrate with the less rest of our client ecosystem. Uh, it's easy to like write your queries in a JSON format over HTTP or also it supports SQL and JDBC. Uh, another nice thing about it is it integrates very well with Superset. So we use Superset quite heavily at Lyft. So it's really popular, especially with users who do not want to write SQL queries. They can just easily do drag and drops and start visualizing all of the data that's coming in from Druid. Uh, Druid really has a uh, really good exhaustive documentation and a large list of uh, community contributed extensions and plugins. So what's really nice about that is you can uh, then configure a flavor of Druid that suits your needs. We use a bunch of these extensions in our setup. So that's really, it's really uh, flexible in that sense. So this is what our new architecture looks like. 
uh, we still have the events generated from our Lyft app on the mobile phones as well as our services. So the box over here highlighted in blue is the real-time pipeline. We make use of a streaming uh, framework. Basically, we have an app uh, implemented in Flink that reads real-time events data from the Kinesis stream, does some transformation, and dumps the event data out in Protobuf uh, onto a Kafka topic. And Druid can be configured to be a Kafka consumer. So in real time, it will start reading the data off of the Kafka topic and start indexing the data and producing segments, which will then be available for an end user to start querying through Superset. Yeah, we continue to have our uh, pipe. We have revised our older pipeline to also uh, overcome the issues of the data, like the data lag. We now have another Flink app that dumps data in Parquet near real time. And all of our DAGs uh, kind of kick off much sooner. So we don't have issues with the lag anymore. For the older complex uh, data sets, which are still in Hive, we continue to use Presto. And for some of it, we use Druid. So to go a little deeper into the real-time pipeline, uh, so we have a also, all event definitions at Lyft are configured using the protobuf uh, format. So we have a central ideal repo that kind of tracks and is the source of truth for all event definitions. And all of our services hook on to that repo to ensure the source of truth. Uh, for legacy reasons, the event data that's produced is still in JSON format and dumps all of it lands up on a Kinesis stream. Uh, the reason we went with Flink uh, at Lyft is because it has really nice uh, support for functional APIs as well as SQL. Like it's really easy to write a SQL query to be able to transform uh, or do some sort of data processing in real time. So we have the Flink app, a default Flink app, which is configured to have a source as Kinesis and a sync uh, as Kafka. So uh, what we do is we do some basic transformations. And as you can see, we dump the data out in a protobuf format. So the reason we went with that is because uh, the ingestion latency of Druid, the performance is not all that great with JSON. It's a lot more performant with protobuf or Avro or any other format that has kind of schema built into it. So as a result, the deserialization is a lot uh, uh, faster. So what we do is we read from JSON, we convert that into protobuf. And if the users like, they could also uh, add in some custom configurations to do some sync SQL based transformations. So all of that transform data is dumped on to a Kafka topic. So we have an in-house Kafka cluster, which is highly reliable. And we have a Druid controller, which is basically uh, responsible for submitting the supervisor job that then st uh, starts reading from a Kafka topic and starts see, uh, uh, indexing it in real time in Druid. We have a custom row parser implementation on Druid. So it basically uses uh, descriptor files to deserialize uh, the protobuf data that's on the Kafka topic uh, and then converts it into the format that can be persisted into segments. Other than our Flink app, there have been some corner custom cases where they want to do something fancier with functional APIs. So in that case, they spin off their own custom Flink apps, which generate data into Kafka and use the rest of our pipeline to get uh, their uh, events data into Druid in real time. And yeah, since we use protobuf and also Druid has a really nice graceful way of handing off between jobs, uh, it's very easy to support schema evolution. So in that way, it's really non-disruptive to make as many changes as you would like to your schema definitions. Uh, so yeah, uh, Tianyu will be talking about uh, the batch ingestion and a bunch of use cases at Lyft. So I'll hand it off to Tianyu right now. Uh, so thank you, Shunya. So uh, in this part, I will uh, briefly uh, dive deep into the Lyft Druid setup. 
So let me share my screen. Yeah. Uh, so uh, with the real time ingestion pipeline, uh, we still need to have the do the batch ingestion because uh, there are some use cases where uh, the data is massive and uh, like our user don't have the requirement to like query the recent record. Uh, so like with the batch ingestion ready, it can save for some like real time ingestion pipeline. And uh, we are using the airflow to uh, like submit to the Druid overlord and uh, run those like batch ingestion job in Hadoop. And those map reduce job are like kicked off to ingest data from data lake into Druid. And in Lyft, our uh, major data lake is the Hive. And why we find it very useful? Because like compared with the real time ingestion, uh, the, like the batch ingestion always result in fewer segment number. And uh, it, those like segment are better like aggregated. So it can save us like some storage uh, like money. And the second uh, like uh, very useful thing we find is that like in case if there's any like downtime in the real time pipeline, uh, the batch ingestion can like serve as like a fallback uh, to avoid any possible data losses here. Uh, so uh, next uh, I'm gonna talk about the, a little bit about the like, compaction. So we use the similar pipeline as the batch ingestion to perform like the uh, Druid compaction uh, for those like segment. And we also use the airflow to schedule DAG job and submit to the overlord and run uh, the task in Hadoop. So, uh, but like different from like fetching data from the hive, uh, like those uh, like compaction DAG actually fetch data from the Druid the data sources, especially those like data sources with larger number of the, like the segment. And those map reduce job are kicked off to like do the re index uh, for like compaction. And uh, uh, we just like uh, uh, enabled uh, several uh, like compaction for several data sources, uh, which has like a very large number of the segment member. And we find out like it's already actually like uh, uh, about like two thirds of the total segment reduction uh, on the count, on the total like segment count and about like one fourth of the segment size reduction. So it can definitely save us a lot of the like the storage money. And uh, on the other hand, we also find that the query performance also got improved. Uh, like that is mainly because with fewer segment number, uh, the, like the query will be like the forward to like fewer segment which benefit the query performance. And the third part is like, we also find that the um, system reliability got improved. Uh, we have some instance in the past which the historical bootstrap time is like as high as like 30 plus minutes. And that like truly hurt our system. And we find out it is because like there are lots of the segment to be loaded and the drop uh, during that time. And so like with the compaction, we significantly reduced the total segment number and this issue has never came back again. So it like truly like improved our system's reliability. So uh, next I'm gonna talk about our uh, Lyft Druid setup. So uh, we are using the open source uh, like fork and the generate uh, like Debian package and deploy it to a set of the Lyft instances. And we are using the open source documentation, which we think like it provides very good points on how to set up uh, Druid clusters. So uh, in Lyft, we have like tens of petabytes of the total data storage in Druid. And we have like up to hundreds of thousands of methods per second to be ingested. And we're using the uh, AWS uh, EC2 instance to host the, the uh, cluster uh, for the historical middle manager, broker, overlord, and coordinator. And we also have some like spe uh, special use cases, which they have like a pretty uh, like tight SLOs to meet. So we set up the hot tier brokers and historical specifically for them. So uh, I uh, just have to mention, uh, we recently uh, just finished the migrate like to the Kubernetes. And it's like, because it's just finished last week. So I can't provide like a, a like specific uh, stats on like how much money we actually save by migrating to the Kubernetes. But we can see that uh, like my, by migrating to the Kubernetes, we find it's like 
uh, the computational resources is like more uh, like efficient. And also we find it like the building and the provisioning process can be like uh, faster than like on the V2 one. So uh, we also have the Flink and the Kafka dedicated cluster uh, for uh, real-time ingestion. And uh, we have the like the Zookeeper and the MySQL RDS for uh, drew the metadata. So as for the uh, deep storage, we are using S3. So as we can see from the like the whole setup, uh, the setup steps, uh, like it involves a lot of the like the moving parts. So it it might be a little bit difficult for like especially the on call person to operate. Uh, so I think it, this is like one part that might need some like improvement in the future. Yeah. So next I'm gonna talk about like how our user uh, integrate their use case on our platform. So uh, instead of just like submitting uh, like supervisor configuration to the Druid overlord, um, we are like implement a tour. We implemented a tour for our user to like uh, config those information. So first user need to define like the port above definition if those like uh, actual schema is a little bit different from the idea that we like already defined. And uh, like then the user needs to provide any like transformation if they want to like transform their event stream. And we, uh, we allow them to like provide like a flink circle query. And next uh, is like we, uh, we want our user to provide us like a config file with uh, information like which column is going to be the timestamp, uh, which columns are going to be the dimensions or matrix. And they also need to provide like some other information like the granularity or like the protocol file names. And for the rest of the information, we have default value. So they don't need to worry about it, but they can still have the option to like override those values. And with all those configuration uh, like setup, uh, like the tour will automatically generate the supervised configuration for them and uh, like submit those configuration to the Druid overlord at the deployment stage. But uh, like they can still like have the option to run the command manually to trigger the submission. And once the supervised configuration submitted to the Druid overlord, the real-time uh, ingestion will be triggered from that. So uh, next I'm gonna like talk about three typical use cases uh, for uh, Druid and Lyft. So the first is the like the inter, uh, use Druid for the interactive web application. So uh, as a rideshare company, uh, we have a, a like a lot of the like customer service agents which have the need to like grab a bunch of the uh, driver within a specific region and within a specific time interval, and that usually like come with some like a. Uh, uh, some like uh, logistic complaints. So it's like pretty urgent to operate. So it's very important for us to like handle those like use cases in a very uh, short time. And which means like the data freshness and the, the query latency is pretty important. And we used to uh, have a like application which like use the DynamoDB to back it up. Uh, but we find it's like compared with Druid it's like significantly more expensive. And uh, like as for the like the key value data source, it's like a little bit complex to model those like time series data. So that's why we switch to use Druid to uh, back up those like geospatial data lookups. And we're using the PyDruid and which is the open source like Python library to, uh, to be used to like to query from the Druid uh, from that uh, service. And at the meantime, we also have like hundreds of thousands of records to be ingested per second uh, through the like the real time ingestion pipeline that we just mentioned. And the, the average query latency is about like 100 milliseconds and the data freshness is less than a minute. And uh, like we can see that like our uh, most of our like customer service agent like don't uh, are not like engineers and they might uh, like uh, have uh, have some high time writing circle and with that uh, like application uh, like they can like uh, the, oh, the only thing they need to do is like draw a like diagram on the map 
uh, to specify the specific uh, geospatial and also like typing the like time interval that they want to search the driver for. And uh, then the like the application will return them all the drivers within uh, like that geo hash special uh, and uh, also the like the specific time interval. So uh, the second use case is to uh, use Druid for data exploration, analytic and tracking. So uh, as we know, like Lyft is like heavily rely on the AWS and we spend like tons of the money on like uh, EC2, a lot of the EC2 or like other AWS instances. And as a company like trying to uh, like pursue the uh, prof uh, pursue to be profitable, it's very important for us to, to track those infra span information. And uh, uh, we 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 try to we hope to build a dashboard to like on top of those like data, uh, and we find like Druid does pretty good job at aggregating data, and uh, like those infra span can be like uh, like can be well presented, uh, like by like which team what what is the total cost for a specific team or like what is the total cost for a specific service, and uh, that's why we are like are using Druid to uh, like. Uh, do it. And we are using the superset to construct the dashboard on top of the Druid data. And we have the like the Pi Druid under the hood to uh, like support that. And for those like uh, info span the data, we are using the batch ingestion to load the data from high to Druid every night. And uh, like we can see the like the query latency, the P99 is less than a second. So uh, like our team members can like quickly retrieve the infra span information and uh, so that it can like uh, be better monitored and uh, so that it can like make some improvement in the further. So uh, the third case is we use Druid for um, as a like time series data store. So we have a forecasting team which they will use the most recent data to make and improve the prediction of some like uh, business matrix, like the ride share demanding, the pricing, et cetera. Uh, and those like prediction are like in the near future. And they like specifically emphasize on like getting the most recent data. So the like the data freshness and the query latency is pretty important in that case. And that's why they are like, uh, choose Druid to like be their like time series data store. And uh, uh, like we can see from their uh, like framework, uh, they are using the Frink app to uh, like ingesting the historical matrix into Druid. And they also have like a, a API to constantly query Druid to get those like historical matrix. And they will put those like historical matrix into a model to generate the forecasting result and then like ingest into Druid again so that it can be like used uh, like further. And uh, because they have like pretty large ingestion volumes and also the query volumes and also like their SLOs is like pretty tight to meet. So we set up a dedicated the hot tier broker and historical nodes for them so that they will have like dedicated the query resources and it will be totally isolated like from the like the query resources with other like data sources. And here I'm gonna share some like system matrix here. So the total ingestion volumes is around like 100K rows like per second. And the query volumes is around like 400 uh, uh, requests per minute. And each request is like grabbing the most recent and hour data of a specific region. And the, the ingestion data freshness is less than 10 seconds. As for the, like the query latency, the P99 is less than like 500 milliseconds. And uh, like, as we can see, like even though Druid is not that famous for doing like scan query, we find out that with proper setup, it's like pretty, uh, like it, it, the performance is pretty good. So I think it's like pretty interesting finding here. So last I'm gonna talk a little bit about the future work that we uh, wanna do with Druid. So first is we hope to have like a Druid configuration tuning tool. 
so uh, this is because like we find uh, some use cases like need multiple rounds of the tuning uh, of the config to like get the like the best performance on the production. And uh, we try to tune on the staging, but like because most of the cases the staging don't have such large volumes of the data as the production. So it like may not have the like the uh, like the best practice there. So uh, we hope to generate a synthetic event to help the user with tuning based on their ingestion and query volumes. And uh, uh, we hope that can like reduce the production like tuning and uh, like help our user with like a, a better onboarding. So the second we hope to have is the automated configuration update for Druid. So as if now, let's see if there's any like uh, idea or changes it will require like multiple runs of the like the deployment. So we hope to have some like tour which will run time pick up those config for Druid, uh, especially like those IDL changes so that it can like avoid like multiple deployment in that, uh, in that way, yeah. So yeah, I think that's pretty much all uh, we wanna like present. Yeah, thanks guys. Well, thank you guys so much for, for the presentation. It's spectacular. Um, we've got seven questions right now. If you do, if anybody in the audience has any questions for our presenters, there is a Q&A button down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please use that. Please don't use the chat. Um, but the Q&A allows us to look at all the questions and then save them for later. If um, Because if we don't get uh, to them today, we will follow up in a blog post. So let's start with, did you have to do anything special to get, the, to get less than 10 seconds data freshness slash latency? So any special setup to be getting at near real-time data? Daniel, uh, do you want to answer that or? Should I take it? Uh, 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 so for actually this data set, we did a number of rounds of, it took a bunch of iterations to actually get the config tuning right. Uh, so the, I think a few configs that we did tune is the task duration and even I forget the name of the setting, but basically uh, the timeout settings on where for how long you can store your segments in memory uh, before it is uh, persisted into segments and gets handed off. And I think another tuning that we did is we actually did tuning on the producing side. So on the data producer side, so this data okay. is mostly like geospatial information and the way they query it uh, and the way it's best represented is by geohash for geohash six. So we actually partition the data on the producer side by those columns. And that really helped a lot with segment sizes as well as kind of like co-locating all the information together. So that gave like good segment sizes, good aggregations and also lesser number of segments being created as a result. So that helped not only with the freshness, but also with the query latency. And those are all definitely uh, best practices, um, especially the um, partitioning on the ingestion task. So thank you so much for that. Okay, do you have anything to control the cluster rolling in Kubernetes to avoid too many historical nodes becoming unavailable? So uh, I think that we uh, set up a uh, uh, like specific uh, script to like rolling, uh, restart the Kubernetes instead of like, even though there's like some updates on the Kubernetes side and it will require the like restart of the Kubernetes, it will still do it in a like uh, rolling way instead of like all in once. So yeah, I, uh, we uh, just uh, like finished that part and uh, like it still like need some time to like watch it out. So yeah, I think we might need to like better monitor like and later if it's like perfect, then we can like think about like contributing that, yeah. Awesome. Uh, there's a couple of questions about using superset versus pivot. Um, what was your decisions and you know, uh, why, why did you decide to go with superset? 
Right. Uh, so we have taken a look at the Pivot UI. It's really very powerful. Uh, and in some sense, I think has better feature, feature set in particular reportings uh, with respect to superset. Uh, but the reason we went with superset is because we are trying to consolidate on the number of visual visualization tools we use at Lyft. And we're also a pretty heavy Presto shop. So we kind of want to just focus and narrow down on very few number of well vetted out clients or UI visualization tools that would work across the board for all of our backend query engines. So right now we are like, we have mode, which is very popular with a lot of our uh, business analysts. And we have Superset, which is really popular with our like engineers, data scientists. Uh, also, we had uh, founding members of Superset at Lyft. Uh, so yes, there's definitely a big push towards uh, making Superset a first-class citizen and dog fooding it at Lyft itself. I was wondering if you're going to mention that one, but yeah, that's a that's a uh, a good reason to be using Superset. Okay, I, if I am using Azure HD Insights Kafka cluster, is it possible to deploy Druid and Flink on the same cluster? What's recommended? Uh, to be honest, I don't know the answer to this. We're a pretty, uh, we're an Amazon shop, not very familiar with Azure. Uh, but in our setup, we do have two separated clusters. Uh, like we run Druid on a dedicated, uh, set of uh, instances and Kafka is a separate thing. I think it helps because we have the Kafka cluster shared across multiple uh, services and various use cases. We just happen to be one of the teams using those clusters. And I think that's kind of the way we've separated it out. Uh, also operationally, I think it's easier to have it out like with the deployments and upgrades and all of that. I would think it might be easier to have them separated out. But I'm not too familiar with the whole Azure piece. Right, so th there's a couple of Azure questions. Uh, I will defer those. Um, so the person who's asking the questions about Azure, if you want to hop on the ASF Slack channel or uh, ask in the Google groups, we can get you answers to Azure style questions um, there. So what kind of issues were you noticing that led to, led to needing co to compact segments further? Uh, so uh, we find out like uh, so so because like the issue that we noticed like is that like a historical node like restart and it took a long time to, for it to like bootstrap and uh, we actually look into the log to like find out that like the bootstrap time like is like pretty bad and uh, they are like we did uh, like a bunch of the, like we, we dropped a very large uh, the uh, sources around that time and find the, like the bootstrap time got improved a little bit. And we think it might be related with like too many segments. And uh, so we try to uh, like uh, make the like, like implement the DAG of the like the compaction. And it turns out like it helped a lot with the like the uh, system reliability. So yeah, I think that leads to us to like find it out. To add to it, I think we have a greater percentage of usage of real-time ingestion than batch. And because of the way our real-time jobs are kind of set up, they tend to flush more frequently and create smaller segments. So we actually started seeing pain points only over time, like as the retention grew. And then we noticed that every time we did like a rolling restart, like each historical would take you know, cumulatively longer time to bootstrap, yeah. which was painful every time we did a deployment. So yeah, okay. going back and compacting historical data for all these real-time ingestion jobs was a big win. Was yeah, and uh, I want to add a little bit. So uh, like mo uh, we, find, we find out there's like a relationship between like, uh, uh, like the task numbers we set for like the real-time ingestion and uh, like the sites, uh, the segment sites that result in the historical, like the more task that we set, the like the smaller like the segment it's gonna be, 
and that's uh, like a distributed issue but yeah it's like it meant to be for like the faster ingestion but we still need to like compact like the historical data afterward and for the, like the better maintenance for the system this wasn't a question from the audience but a follow-up for me did you got do you guys have any late arriving data is that um an issue or is all your data pretty much uh timely we do have late arriving data uh that does happen uh for only certain use cases not necessarily mm -hmm. for all uh that's another reason why we also went with a batch mode for compaction uh because we kind of want to wait for like the 24 hours uh, like the nightly batch kind of waits for 24 hours and then we uh, rebuild the segments from Hive which has like all of the data updated and locked in and then we load that back. Great, so how um, do you have to or how do you deal with the amendments to events that have been ingested uh, via the Flink pipeline? Uh, so I'm guessing the question is to do with schema changes on the events. Uh, yeah, so the current way that works, it works is basically we have this uh, centralized schema repo where updates are made. And once you make, uh, it's all protobuf based. So it's pretty uh, already well designed in terms of evolution. Like a user can just go and add more columns or make a change to the schema. And what happens is where every time there's a schema change, uh, uh, that information is basically picked up by the Flink app. We, we do have to, however, at this point, restart our Flink app because we don't have like an automated way of figuring it out. But we restart our Flink app and submit a new supervisor job with the new schema definition. So once that's done and the data has already landed, that new column will start showing up in your data source. Like for example, the data is not already on the Kafka topic, like no harm, like uh, just that when you query that column in Druid, it's just gonna say like, it's not like no information. Once like the new data is on Kafka, it's gonna start getting picked up on the Druid side of things. Yeah, that's one of my favorite features <coughs> of uh, Druid is that uh, flexible schema. So for those who are come from a more relational background, this concept that you can just add columns as you go is totally cool in Druid. And it sounds like it can be done in this entire pipeline, which is awesome. All right, what do you, um, so great presentation. And what do you use to monitor the Druid cluster? So, and what level of monitoring do you perform? Uh, we rely highly on the, the, the metrics that Druid natively spits out like the, basically like the JMX level metrics that are spit out. And we have our own pipeline for metric collection. Uh, we rely on like StatsD uh, and we push all of those metrics into Wavefront and that lift we use Grafana for all of our dashboarding. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, we also enable the audio to logging for like the query into the druid so it can like help us like like debugging if there's like any querying issue from our customer yeah awesome and the last question is how difficult is to deploy and manage flink sql and kubernetes and to connect to a remote hosted kafka um i think we're a little lucky here that we have a dedicated team like my team doesn't work on the Flink side of things. We actually have a separate team to do it. Uh, but I unfortunately don't have details about like how, like the pain points the team must have faced when they migrated to Kubernetes. Uh, but yeah, I can try to, you know, find that out from our Lyft uh, streaming platform team and share those insights with you later on. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Um... Yeah, thank you both. It was great to hear both of you speak, and this was an incredibly insightful presentation. Um, and thanks all to all you community members for your participation out there. Um, a link to the slides and the recording will follow. 
And I'm sure others in the wonderful community would like to hear your story too. So if you want to do a five minute interview, a blog post, a presentation, we can help you get the word out about how you're using Druid. So please send us an email at community at imply.io to talk more and hear about the Apache Druid community activity across the world. If you're using Druid today, make sure you talk about adding your own entries to the project's Powered By page. So go to the apache.druid.org um, slash Powered By and you can add your own story. So in our next talk, we're gonna be listening to Daniel Hernandez um, at InnoWatts about analyzing electric meter, uh, meters using Druid. And that is in exactly 15 minutes, which is enough time to get a beverage. So for now, goodbye, and I will see you all at the top of the hour. And thanks again to Sharanya and Tianyu. We super appreciate your participation today and um, look forward to hearing you at more events. Thanks, see you. Thank you, see you.